Good evening and welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Maggie Smith in support of Keep Moving. She'll be joined tonight by guest and fellow poet Molly Spencer. As a reminder, you heard me as you were zooming in, but our Zoom etiquette, um, you're muted. You will remain muted. Uh, speaker view is probably the ideal viewing experience this evening. That way you'll just see whoever is speaking on your screen at a given time. And we do ask that you keep your video off through the duration of the event. The chat is closed for public chatting, but you will want to keep the chat frame or box or window open as I will be dropping links periodically to purchase books from Literati Bookstore. And you can also use the chat to directly send to me any questions you might have for the Q&A at the conclusion of the conversation. So whenever you feel a question pop into your head, please be sure to send it to me there in the chat and I'll also send reminders to you to send your questions to me um, throughout the event this evening. Uh, you can purchase Keep Moving on our website. As I mentioned, I will drop a link in the chat if you're watching later on YouTube. There will be links in the description uh, right below me. You can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com. And thousands of titles that are inside of our store are available for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan. And in lieu of a book purchase, we do ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this weeks or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this afternoon or this morning, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. So without further ado, I'll introduce our author and moderator. Maggie Smith is the award-winning author of several books of poetry, including Good Bones, The Well Speaks of Its Own Poison, Lamp of the Body, The List of Dangers, and Nasting Dolls. A 2011 recipient of a Creative Writing Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, she has also received several individual excellence awards from the Ohio Arts Council, two Academy of American Poets prizes, a Pushcart Prize, and fellowships from the Sustainable Arts Foundation and the Virginia Center for Creative Arts. She has been widely published, appearing in the New York Times, Tin House, the Gettysburg Review, the Southern Review, and more. And Molly Spencer's poetry has appeared in Blackbird, Copper Nickel, Field, Gettysburg Review, New England Review, Plowshares, and Prairie Schooner. She is a poetry editor at Rumpus. Her debut co collection, If the House, won the 2019 Bringham Prize, selected by Carl Phillips. She has a new book this out, out this month as well, and will be joining us to celebrate that at the end of the month. And you can find out more info uh, about that event and more at literatibooksorecom slash event. Please jo join me in using your Zoom uh, clap or heart reactions to welcome Maggie Smith and Molly Spencer to your living rooms. Well, thank you, John, and thank you, Maggie, for um, having this conversation tonight. I know I've been looking forward to it. We keep saying in, in emails and on social media how we wish it were in person, and of course, we, we all wish that of, um, for so many things right now. Um, but thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. Um, we're hoping that this can be kind of a conversation between friends and po fellow poets. Um, and we're looking very forward to your questions um, toward the end of the program. So don't be shy about typing them into the chat as they occur to you um, or taking little notes as I often do at readings and then asking them when we get to the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, Maggie, I, I imagine that most people here in our audience tonight know a little bit about how this book came into being, but on the off chance that, that some might not, um, I was wondering if you'd start by just telling us the origin story of this book and then maybe reading a few of the, the earliest or maybe your favorite affirmations that began this, this book that um, were the beginning of this book as it was set in motion. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. I'm so I wish we were uh, together uh, in Ann Arbor and then traipsing off afterwards to share a meal and gab. <laughs> that would be <laughs> lovely. This, this is the next best thing. Um, yeah, so this, um, this is a book that I began writing without knowing I was writing a book, uh, which is to say, 
a couple of years ago in the fall of 2018, as my marriage was ending, um, you know, as they say, every, every ending is also a beginning. I began tweeting uh, sort of uh, positive notes to self, uh, little self pep talks that would help me get through the day. And um, I guess maybe I'll read a few of them so you can kind of get a sense of what they are. That would be great. The ending of one thing is also the beginning of another. What is the next adventure? There is room enough in this life with its many endings, its many beginnings for things you could not have imagined last week or last year or 10 years ago. Keep moving. I flag just a few. Focus on who you are and what you've built, not who you'd planned on being and what you'd expected to have. Trust that the present moment, however difficult, however different from what you'd imagined, has something to teach you. Keep moving. Maybe one more. Do not turn away joy, even if it arrives at an inconvenient time. Even if you think you should be grieving, even if you think it's too soon, Joy is always on time. Keep moving. So I was writing these first thing in the morning, uh, usually on my phone <laughs> in bed before I had my first cup of coffee and tweeting them really as a way of holding myself accountable for, for that intention for the day. Um, I really didn't think they would resonate with other people to the degree that they ended up resonating with other people. But pretty quickly, I started hearing from people um, who would say things like, oh, that's exactly what I needed to hear in this moment, or that's going to help me get through the next three hours, or um, I wish I would have read that five years ago when I was going through X or Y or Z. And, and so I continued to do it both because it made me feel better. Um, I I talk about it as sort of feeling like I was trying on hope for size. Yeah. And in the beginning, it felt really terrible and misshapen and scratchy and oversized. And um, as I tried it on over and over and over again, I found myself growing into it, which I didn't expect and was kind of a strange uh, side effect of all of this. But also just the sense of community that I found through this project, which is at a time when I felt really alone and just frankly terrible and was having a hard time functioning as, a, as an adult <laughs> and as a writer and a parent and a person, mm -hmm. um, having this connection with other people, how, wherever they were, felt really um, buoying at, at that time. And so it's become a book because people asked for a book which has never been how I've made a book of poems. No one's banging down my door asking. <laughs> imagine that. Can you imagine? Um, no. <laughs> no, me, me either. I mean, when you write a book of poems, you, you basically get to a point where you think you have enough pages and you print it all out and then you see if there's a shape or, you know, a thread or something. Um, and with this, I was just tweeting and planning on doing it for as long as it felt good to me and useful. Mm -hmm. And then in time, it, it, I felt also like it was useful for others. And so as long as we were sort of in that together, I would keep doing it. But enough people asked for something tangible that I thought, well, maybe there's, maybe this is something that could exist off of the internet outside of the ether. And so that's what, that's what we made. Great. So you said about this book that you began writing it without realizing you were writing a book. And I've only written two books, but that has definitely been my experience with both of them. Is that true for you when you're writing a book of poems as well, that you look up one day and you think, oh, maybe this is something? Or was this kind of a different experience for you than, than working either knowingly or unknowingly toward a, a poetry collection? Yeah, I mean, that's my experience with a poetry collection is usually I get to a point where it's been a number of years since my last book. And I go into the Word document that include, you know, the Word file that includes all the poems I've written since that book was published. I print them all out and then I see if they hang together and I just kind of sit and chuck the stuff that doesn't feel like it belongs 
and I look at what sort of what the images are and how they're connected. And usually I'm pleasantly surprised in that whatever I've been sort of chewing on in my mind over those years makes the thing stick together. And it feels to me like it could be a book. This was different in that I was sort of writing it as I go, more as a daily practice. Mm -hmm. And then in working with my editor, she was the one who said, what if this isn't a book of daily affirmations? What if it's more than that? Because you're a writer. So maybe we could actually put a little bit more meat on the bone. Could you write personal essays that give some context to the ideas that are in the quotes? And I thought, I think I can. not <laughs> I will certainly try. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and so what the book is, is the six personal essays with the quote sort of interwoven through it. Um, but it, it was, we were really making it up as we went. And I didn't have a model for what this book could be because it's not really like any other book I've read before. So it's not like a collection of poems where I just have to, get the right poems in the right order and have it hang together. It was more like, is this a genre that exists? And if not, can we get it, can we pull this off? So, and I feel, I feel like I should make a big disclaimer here because being a fellow writer and a fellow poet, I'm, I'm really interested in process and I'm really interested in the differences between the work that you would normally do kind of as a poet and the work that this book was and required of you. Um, so sorry in advance to our audience <laughs> if I ask a lot of process questions, <laughs> but that's kind of where my, my brain tends to go. So I'm, I'm curious about what you learned as a writer about putting this kind of book together. Um, if there's anyone in our audience who hasn't held the, your copy of the of Maggie's book in your hands yet it is a um a book of of affirmations the daily affirmations that she wrote but but it's kind of held together on this skeleton of personal essays that that both kind of foreground and illuminate um and categorize almost um some of the affirmations so in 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 writing those essays and in trying to shape a book that's in many ways very different from a poetry collection. What did you learn as a writer that you think is going to be useful to you in your future work? Well, it's, it's funny. I always try to write poems first. So if I have an idea for anything, I will always try to make it fit in a poem before I go to another genre. So writing over the past couple of years, I've tried to write poems about many things. And then I get into the poem and it feels like I'm kind of in an extreme tiny house <laughs> where I'm like bumping my head and bumping my elbows and I can't move. And I, and I think part of that is about, it speaks to the kind of poet I am, which is not, I'm not writing long narrative or talky poems. Most of my poems are pretty tight and concise and, you know, fairly crystallized around a specific metaphor or a specific moment in time. And so when you're trying to talk through an idea or tell a story or pull in backstory from your childhood to maybe explain your thinking or behavior around a current situation. I would always try to do it in a poem and fail because I just couldn't, it was not the right container. And so one of the things I learned in writing this book is that not everything is a poem. Mm -hmm. Like poems are great for certain kinds of writing, but sometimes um, I need to be able to sort of move a little bit more. And so the essay gave me freedom that I, that I didn't have in a poem. And I, I liked the room that I had there. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, though, I will say writing personal essays, writing the work that went into this book was much scarier <laughs> than, than, writing, um, than writing poems about the same material. So in writing a poem, you know, I have poems in good bones about my children. I have poems in good bones about experiencing miscarriage, but there's still that, that I, mm -hmm. yeah. and we have, even if it's sort of an illusion, because we all know, if you know the poet, you're, you know, the writer is not the speaker. 
So you have a little bit of cover, even if the speaker is right on top of you, even if it's like tissue right. in. I think Marvin Bell maybe is the person who said, the I in my poems is not me, but it's someone who knows me pretty well. <laughs> but there is still that little, at least a veneer of artifice. <laughs> yes, like there's at least the illusion or you can say, well, the speaker, you don't say the writer is the right. I. And so the difference here is that I had to, um, or got to, depending on how I want to look at it, write these as myself. And so the person in Keep Moving is the person that you would see at Kroger or walking her dog or picking the kids up from school. Like there's no speaker, it's just me. And um, it was both scary and sort of exhilarating to be able to do that in this book and ha be, have to pull the cover mm -hmm. off. And not and not have that. Um, and I'm kind of wondering. I mean, I I've, I've been writing poems, but I am kind of wondering how writing this book will impact my my poems, or how spending so much time writing prose because um, I'm working on another book of essays now. So how spending this much time in prose will change or not my poems maybe i'll just be so delighted to retreat back into these into the tiny house <laughs> into the tiny house it'll just feel so feeling. lovely <laughs> <laughs> well keep us posted okay keep us posted um so one of the things that i was really interested in in this book is um as i read it and reread it and thought about it um kind of I guess mostly through the essays in which you talked about um, going, allowing, write, allowing the practice of writing these affirmations to um, let it kind of take you back and heal things from your mm -hmm. past that had never healed, which I think is a really hard thing to do when you're in a caregiving role, like you're a mother, I'm a mother, like caregiving is such a forward looking task mm. um, because we're always thinking about oh, what's next like the orthodontist appointment and who has volleyball practice and oh I better thaw something for tomorrow's dinner um, but I'm, re I'm really interested in that process of how the practice of writing these affirmations both allowed you to go back to pasts or a past that still was in need of you and in need of your attention somehow but then later in the book, you also talk about refusing to go back to what you call the cluttered past. And I was kind of conceiving of these different pasts as I read. And because I just happened to know that you were very close to Stanley Plumley, who is one of my very dear poets, I never knew Stan, but his work and his essays and the things that he has said about poetry have been important to me. And one of the things that he said that I was reminded of recently um, on the Kenyon Review website is that poetry is essentially made up of two things, the, the moment and memory. And so I, I'm just thinking about all of the pasts that are calling to you as, as a person and as a writer, both the past that needs you to come back, the cluttered past that is perhaps best left alone. Hmm. And then the, the past that you need to be able to do your writing. Do you, and I just wonder if you can talk about those multiple pasts and if you conceive of it that way um, and how they inform your writing, either this book or your poetry or both. You know, I think um, I love that idea of, I mean, Stan has all the best lines. <laughs> That's the thing about Stan. I mean, the, to write, whether it's an essay or a poem, I think it's always our present self in conversation with some or multiple prior experiences. I mean, that's like metaphor is completely coming from a place of comparison based on what we already know. I mean, that's why kids can make them because they can look at a faucet and say that looks like an elephant's trunk because they're drawing on what they know from before. I think what's different for me about how I conceive of or deal with the past in, in writing versus in life is 
in writing, we get to choose what to revisit. Mm -hmm. You know, we, if I don't want to write a poem about a certain thing that happened or a certain aspect of my past, I don't have to, I never have to revisit that thing in writing again, but I don't get to choose what I remember. I have to live with that. Um, And it makes me think of, it makes me think of the film, um, eternal sunshine of the spotless mm, mind. I love that. Like film. me too. And it's a heartbreaker. It and, really and is <laughs> really not something that should be watched when you're going through a divorce. Um, because it's, you know, it is so tempting, I think, to want to scrub the mind, like forget the material. Yeah. Like I don't mm-hmm. want any of that experience as material. It is so tempting to want to scrub the mind of the clutter and not the positive clutter, but the stuff that you wish you could leave where it landed. And I mean, another thing is, is so much of what happens in the present can color our perception of the past. So when something goes wrong, you're looking back to think like, where did it go wrong? Right. Or was that all false? Or was it only false from this point forward? Or... So, I mean, a lot of, a lot of writing this book was about considering, like really going back to childhood and considering the kind of person uh, I've been all along and where I was able to shift some of those things and kind of where I still have work to do because don't we all? So I really want you to tell us about the Troika at dusk because (laughs) that (laughs) phrase, (laughs) I have, I have caught myself being the Troika at dusk since reading that phrase in this book. So tell us a little bit about that past self and maybe. The troika at dusk. It is, it is so true. Um, yeah. So there's a, there's a passage um, in the book where I talk about the kind of kid I was. And, and actually if, if you met my family, if you met anyone in my family, my sisters, my dad, my mom, my aunts, my uncles, and you said the Troika at dusk, they would start laughing and they would be like, oh, Maggie. Yeah. Um, because it's still a phrase that we use to describe what a scaredy cat I was. So basically, this, the story comes from going to amusement parks when I was a kid. And I was the oldest. Um, I am the oldest of, of three sisters. And my two younger sisters were very brave and would go on every roller coaster. It didn't matter how tall. It didn't matter, you know, at midnight, they would go on the tallest roller coaster at midnight. And I would basically sit on a bench with a box of saltwater taffy waiting for them to come back from the rides because I had no desire to do any of that. But the one ride that I felt really comfortable on because it was sort of a baby ride was this ride called the Troika. And it had these like three, you know, multiple spinning arms and it would kind of like a spider ride, like a scrambler, and it would kind of throw you out in one direction. I found it thrilling. Um, and so the, the idea that the most risk I was willing to take as a child was riding the Troika at dusk um, became a thing. And so the Troika at dusk is now a shorthand phrase in my family for the kind of person I was for a really long time. And I would say, only in the past couple of years am I no longer a Troika at dusk kind of human. And in some ways having, um, having a lot of change thrown at me has made me um, have to become braver just out of necessity. Yeah, so that makes me think about um, another kind of really strong theme in, in the book and something that I'm really interested in as a writer and a, and a person is revision, right? Um, So much of the book is about revision. The first section is titled revision. And I, and, and reading both the essays in that section and, and just knowing the story of this book had me thinking about how, how sometimes we get to revise and you write about revising your thinking about loss and and going back to your past and healing things and then sometimes we get revised and we kind of have to catch up to the revision that just happened in our life and i think um i'm i'm interested in your ideas about revision as a conscious act which um 
we, perhaps you've you've done to become this person who is now like more inclined to do the demon drop at midnight than the trika at dusk. <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> and the kind of um, the following our noses type of revision that we do sometimes as poets, but also sometimes as people when we're in these times of upheaval and we're just trying to do the next right small thing in the next second to get through the next portion of the day and and what you've kind of what what do you know as a writer about revision that that helped you in this period of revision of your life and what do you know from this period of revision in your life that you think is going to help you as a writer you know, revision is my favorite part of writing because it's the hard part. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, for me, the best part, the best time I have with a poem or an essay is when I have the not right words in the not right order and there's creative problem solving and I have to sort of troubleshoot it and it's like wrestling with it. That I love. And I realize that might sound a little bit a little bit masochistic, but I think, you know, those of us who write know that sort yeah. of like good trouble that we get into when we're really sort of wrestling with a piece of writing and, and seeing things click. But then if one thing clicks, it throws off everything else. And then we have to sort of go and, and figure that out. And so, you know, I think I've always been open to the idea of revision. However, sometimes in life, we don't get to choose the change, right? It's not like, we don't always get to say, I'm not happy in my career. I'm going to go back to school and retrain and do this other thing. You don't always get to say like, I'm not happy in this relationship. I'm going to leave and do this other thing. So often it is handed to us. Um, we are, revision is delivered to us <laughs> or our lives are revised. Um, and then we have to decide, decide sort of what to do with it. And so for me, it's, it's sort of been, about thinking of, of the unexpected gift of having, having change or upheaval put upon you and then deciding, okay, it's a mess right now. Like just like a poem might be in the beginning or just like an essay might be in the beginning. It, it is a mess. I mean, all of my first drafts are messes. They look terrible. They're circled bits and arrows and underlining and crossed out things. And so at, at a point when your life kind of looks like that draft, what next? Like what, what next? And so part of the project for me was about um, kinder self-talk also. Mm -hmm. You know, because I don't beat up my poems when they're not behaving. I just work with them. And so I tried to kind of bring that spirit to myself and my own life, which is like, okay, what now? Where, where can we make a positive change? It's going to be probably something small, like this little enjambment here. What is the analogous thing in my life? Well, maybe I just need to get up today and maybe I'll run mm -hmm. or maybe I'll go to yoga or maybe I'll you know, use the time I have now to cultivate this friendship or to focus on my kids or like what positive kind of unexpected gift can I find in the midst of all of this mess that might help me shape it into something I can live with, even though I know it's not going to happen overnight. And it doesn't happen overnight with writing either. No, it doesn't. I really like that idea of, you know, we don't beat our, we don't beat our poems up, but we it's much easier to beat ourselves up, right? Um, so that, and we don't that, do that with our friends. I mean, no, when we our don't friends with, come to right. us and say, oh my gosh, I lost my job, or oh, I got this scary diagnosis, or oh, I, you know, I just had this terrible breakup, or my child's having these issues and I don't know what to do. We, we're not like, well, what's wrong with you that this right. bad thing is happening in your life? Well, clearly you deserve <laughs> it. Like, if you had made better choices at these other points, this wouldn't be happening to you. You would never say that to your best friend or your right. sister or your, or your neighbor. But these are the things I think we tell ourselves wittingly mm -hmm. or not. Um, and, you know, part of this project is about giving ourselves the compassion that we give others really easily 
but we often withhold it from ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, somewhat related to that, I, I, I want to go back and talk more about optimism and how it didn't feel natural at first. And you were like trying it on, but it didn't fit, but that eventually it felt okay. It started to feel comfortable, like breaking in a code or something. Yes. Um, and you also write in the book about hope being an imaginative act. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd love to know if you, um, if you think of writing as an inherently hopeful fact or, or act rather, um, if you think of the exercise of writing a poem using your imagination to do that or an essay, is that a naturally optimistic act for you always or is it a different kind of imagination? And then I wonder, I'd love to hear, um, some of the affirmations, again, aligned with this idea of trying on hope trying and trying on, on optimism. Well, first I will say, I do, think, I do think writing is, or making art in general is an optimistic act because we're putting something into the world that the world isn't asking us for or, or perhaps even paying us for or rewarding us for. We're we're doing it for its sake, for its own sake. Um, And that that act to me feels optimistic and hopeful. I mean, I say hope is imaginative because just the idea of thinking that tomorrow might be better than today requires us to use our imaginations and see something that isn't there, Um, or at least be able to see something that might possibly could, fingers crossed, be there. Um, Maybe I'll read just a little a little section of one of the essays. That would be great. um, About this move toward optimism, which for people who who have known me since I was a child is about as rare as as bravery for me. (laughs) Um, When my daughter was in preschool, she wanted to know everything about the world. At ages three and four, she used every short drive to the post office, the library, or the grocery store to ask me big questions from her car seat behind me. What is the earth for? What is the future? What is the past? Where was I before I was in your belly? I could almost hear her mind worrying, worrying, unable to shut itself down. I had an old MacBook that did that until it burned my lap. Some nights she couldn't turn the thoughts off. I remember those difficult tuck-ins. I told her thoughts are like birds. Some just fly away, but others nest. Our thoughts are nesters. They don't want to leave us and they make themselves right at home. I knew what she must have been picturing, winged thoughts gathering twigs and ribbons and even, because we'd seen it once, scraps of plastic grocery bags, winged thoughts weaving a home for themselves in her skull. I told her the truth as I knew it, that her head is such a beautiful place to live, more beautiful than any sycamore, maple, or oak, that no wonder nothing wants to leave her nothing and no one, least of all me. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Something unexpected and frankly life-altering happened when my marriage ended. I realized I could no longer afford to be a pessimist. I could no longer allow my worst thoughts to gather twigs and ribbons and make a permanent home in my mind. I realized pessimism wasn't going to get me out of bed or get the coffee made or pack the kids lunches or do the laundry or make my deadlines. Pessimism wasn't going to help me or my children. And so in a very dark time, it occurred to me that being optimistic moment by moment was a gift I could give myself. Even if whatever I'm hoping for doesn't materialize, I am feeding my spirit in the meantime. I'm not poisoning the present with worry or despair or defeatist thinking. Today, I think of myself as a recovering pessimist. I know that optimism is not at odds with wisdom. It's quite the opposite. I think of cynicism as cool, but lazy, while hope is desperately uncool. It has sweaty palms and an earnest smile on its face. What I know to be true is that one hopeful person will accomplish more than a hundred cynics. Why? Because the hopeful person will try. So recovering pessimist is something I I think I will probably always be in recovery (laughs) for being 
for being a pessimist. I um, think poets, yeah, there's a there's yeah, a strain of that in us. There's a strain of that in us. <laughs> but it's 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 one thing to sort of go to the go to that place in your mind that's sort of a melancholy place when you're thinking through a poem, but it's no way to live. Right. It's no way to live moment by moment by moment. It's just, it's not tenable or sustainable, I, I don't think. Or at least I don't want to live, I don't want to live in that headspace if I can avoid it. So one, an, another thing that you write about in the book is um, going through this, this very painful and uncomfortable transformation, but at the end of it kind of becoming more yourself. And I remember, on, I saw on Twitter, I don't even know when it was, sometime in the last several months. And I don't even know who wrote it and I can't find it anymore. I looked for it prior um, to this conversation so that I could cite it properly. But someone posted, all you need to do as a writer is to become more yourself. Unfortunately, this makes you less and less pleasant to be around. <laughs> And when I first saw it, I just laughed and I was like, yes, I need someone to explain this to my family for me. <laughs> but um, because what, what I think is that, that hopefully we're all changing and becoming more ourselves as we make our way through this life. But at least in my life, that has caused some friction. Um, and I wonder if, the process of both kind of writing this book and be, and writing in a different way and also just the process of living these years and, and going through this transformation at the end of which you actually feel like a more true version of yourself. What kind of frictions did that bring, if any, mm -hmm. um, either to your writing or to your life? And, and what can we learn from those frictions? Well, I mean, I think anytime, anytime you're writing um, about your life and perhaps writing about other people mm -hmm. in your life, that, that can and probably does cause friction. And so, um, again, the cover that I enjoy in poetry is also cover that probably others in my life have enjoyed in poetry or just haven't been written about. Um, I will never forget giving a reading from Good Bones and a question from the audience at the end was, what is it like being a single parent? I was not a single parent. I was married when I wrote that book. Mm -hmm. But my then husband doesn't appear at all in that book. And so I realized a couple of things. One, oh, that's pre that was prescient. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was writing the book that I would end up living a couple of years later um, but also, you know, I didn't feel compelled to have everything be material right. for my writing. And so now, I mean, the friction really, I would say is more internal because I have to consider what do I want to say? How do I want to say it? What do I want to hold back? What is nobody's business, even if they're curious? Mm -hmm. Um, how do I, you know, how do I write authentically, but also protect my children's privacy and my uh, friend's privacy and my parents' privacy? So, I mean, those are things I think about as I get older and just, you know, as a writer, you know, I, I don't remember who said it, but there's some line about, you know, a family is ruined whenever there's a writer. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it's kind of funny, it's, you know, it's, it's meant as a humorous quote, but I definitely don't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be telling tales out of school. I really do want um, for people to be comfortable with how they're portrayed uh, for the most part, or, or at least can see that I'm being uh, sort of respectfully uh, mum on, on certain things, because I just think it's, it's better that way. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. I, yeah, I definitely don't want, it's like people are talking at the dinner table and you walk into the room and everybody 
<laughs> stops talking because they don't want you to overhear anything. I don't want, I don't, you know, I don't want to be, want to be person. that person. No. And I think as a poet, no one's been really worried about it, but you know, I worry now it's like, Oh, she's writing about her life. Will yeah. we appear or, Oh, I hope we appear or I hope we don't appear. Um, so, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't been too, too much so far. So that, that makes me think about, um, the act of writing about things that either other people, but very often our culture doesn't want us to talk about Mm -hmm. things like miscarriage and postpartum depression and terribly fussy babies that are just breaking you. Right. Um, And you talk, you write in the book about how, when you're writing poetry, you're following language and that's very much my experience of writing poetry, but it, it occurred to me that um, some of the writing that you did in this book about things like miscarriage and, and difficult experiences with infants and postpartum depression and anxiety, that seems less like being able to follow language. It, it's almost as if you're pressing up against a resistance in the culture and you talk about, um, writing about those things and writing about suffering as um, an act of collective observation, not, mm-hmm. not this is about me, but this is about us. And I was just really interested in that framework and curious about kind of how you got to that place where you felt like I can write about this. I'm not just talking about my own life. I'm talking about a collective experience here that, that maybe I can give to the world? Well, I mean, I think whenever we are sharing our struggles with others, we're giving them a gift. We're offering them something that we don't have to offer. We could just privately process that. But I think, I think it is a gift to share those things with other people. And it's a gift I've received. I mean, when I, when I think about what gave me the courage to write this book, it's other people's books. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, you know, Emily Rapp's work and it's Sharon Olds's work and it's Kelly Sundberg's work and Lucas Mann's work. And, you know, I think about all of the people who, whether it's in poetry or prose, have written about um, addiction or suicide or um, depression or, you know, miscarriage or any kind of grief or loss that is and it and it, I think it kind of spooks people like if, if they think that you're in pain people kind of back away mm-hmm. it makes mm-hmm. us uncomfortable but I do think of sort of literature in general as being self-help <laughs> because it helps, <laughs> you know it helps us reimagine things it helps us see what's possible and I think it also gives us permission to tell those stories and you know there were there were books that really helped me through the last couple of years. And my hope is that maybe Keep Moving will be one of those books that people give to the person who is really in the weeds, Mm -hmm. who needs a little something. I mean, I hope they also take food to that person and I hope they also spend time to that, for that, you know, person, but you know, books are one of those things that uh, I think can really pull us out of, deep, dark places. And, um, and my hope is that maybe this will be one of those, be one of those books. That's kind of what compelled me to, to make it. Well, maybe we can wrap up this portion of the evening with some of your words from the book in your voice. And um, so if, if you would just maybe want to read another short selection, and then I think we could shift to, um, looking at the questions that our audience has tonight. Okay. I was going to read a portion of an essay, but we're like a little short on time. So I think I'm just going to pick one of the quotes. Um, And we'll go from there. Okay. Okay. This one makes me think a lot about uh, what we're all going through this year with the pandemic and what I think of as the before times um, when we could have been in the same room. 
Stop obsessing over the lasts. Be ready to greet the firsts and yet unseen nexts that are coming around the bend. Look alive. They'll be here any minute now. Keep moving. That is a hopeful thought. Thank you um, for that really lovely conversation and for those readings. Uh, we have a couple questions. People can um, continue to submit their questions to me in the chat and I'll ask them. Um, the first one is something I'm going to maybe reframe and, and ask to both of you. And it's a question about um, getting started. So the question is about how, how, how Maggie got started as a writer. And, but maybe it's a question I can open up to both of you is, is how you got started um, with, with poetry. Um, and, and also maybe as well as, as, as people here, maybe authors, budding authors looking to be published, maybe how you got started submitting your work out or finding avenues for publication. I, I like that question. I started writing poems in high school when most people start writing poems. <laughs> <I think. laughs> um, because there's so many feelings and nowhere to put them. Um, and I think they were mostly bad Sylvia Plath cover poems for at least a while. And I would put them in a manila folder in my locker and give my combination out to trusted friends and they could come and check out the poems and then write little notes on them to give me feedback. So that's, um, that's kind of how I started working on poems, mostly inspired by um, some poets I was reading and then also listening to like a lot of Beatles music and writing the lyrics down in my bedroom. As far as um, publishing, I think I started sending work out really when I was in graduate school and one of the things I would say about that to maybe inspire people who are, who are getting started is there are poems in my first book and in my second book that I wrote when I was in college. So um, I say that not because I was a phenom, because I was not. I say that because I think sometimes we think of our early work as like not quite their work or just getting started work or amateur work or, and I, um, I say that to sort of affirm that maybe the work you're doing when you start out is your work and um, is worth, is worth keeping and, and hanging on to and, and, and maybe you shouldn't discount it. I want to hear from Molly how she, how she got started. Well, I know this is going to be a shocker, but very similarly <laughs> in writing poems in my bedroom. Although I, I think I did start in middle school and I, I used my dad. My dad was a chemistry teacher when I was a kid and he had this old typewriter that had all of the chemical symbols and, and a lot of um, math signs so that he could type up his exams. But it, what that meant is that it didn't have all the letters and punctuation marks that I needed in my poems. So my earlier poems um, that I wrote then, which were also terrible, um, were kind of sprinkled through with chemistry symbols. <laughs> um, and I, so I had a different, path. I, resist, I resisted poetry for a long time. I, I always wrote and read poetry, but I thought I'd probably better do something more practical. And I studied economics and I studied public policy. And I, I was always writing, reading and writing. Um, and then I, I thought I, I probably, I really want to be a mom and I don't know if I can be both a writer and a mom. So like I have actively tried to quit poetry several times <laughs> and I still feel like I would actually quit if I could, but I can't like, I have to write in order to function. Um, and then I had an experience in midlife in my late thirties, early forties where I, where I actually became quite ill. And it kind of was a, um, a reckoning moment for me where I realized like, oh, I think I better actually do this work of poetry. Mm. Um, I, I actually think this is part of my life's work. And so I, I, I committed to it then. And I, I didn't start sending my poems out until I was in my 40s. And I didn't publish my first book until I was 47. Um, and the book I have coming out this month 
is a book that I wrote when my kids were tiny and they are now in college and high school. So I want to echo what Maggie said, you know, the poems you start out with, um, the poems you learn with are not necessarily for the birds. Um, but I would just encourage budding writers to read and write and read and write and read and write. That's how I, that's how I've done it. Yep. Um, there's a question. Um, if Maggie could talk more about what books were helpful to her. Mm-hmm. I'm, I feel very lucky. I have like a little library cart that I keep here so I can look at the books <laughs> that I found really helpful. Um, so what was I reading? I was reading, uh, I read No Happy Endings by Nora McInerney. I found that really helpful. Emily Rapp's The Still Point of the Turning World. I loved um, Goodbye, Sweet Girl by Kelly Sundberg. I loved. Uh, I read some Deborah Levy that I found really helpful. And then poems. Even though, you know, I, as soon as I knew I was getting divorced, I went back to Stag's Leap by Sharon Olds and I dragged out Meadowlands by new Nobel yeah. awardee uh, Louise Glick because I knew there was language that I could access in those books that would help me think about how to write those experiences myself. Um, But I mean, really, I mean, I I say, it sort of sounds like facetious when I say like all literature is self-help, but I really, I'm, if I'm not feeling good, any, I can pick any book off my shelf and find something in it that will make me feel better because it's, how that writer is engaging with language and what they're showing me through what they're saying engages with my mind in such a way that it works better than ice cream and television, Um, which is good because if ice cream and television were more effective, I would just do that. But so far books are, books are winning. I have to agree. We've got time for, for one more question and it's for both of you. And I think it's actually a good question to end on um, for both. Do you have any tips for remaining productive when everything going on in the world right now can make writing feel a lot harder than usual? Mm, well, I guess the first thing I would say is cut yourself some slack. Um, the word productive sometimes makes me cringe because I think, is that productivity something that you want for yourself or or, or are you feeling the pressure to make something of this time? Like we've got all this time, we're home, we should be accomplishing more. Part of me just thinks like, well, maybe if we're, you know, living and surviving and we have our mental health, that's enough. So I would, I would maybe back off of of pressuring ourselves in this time to be super productive. Um, But one thing that helps for me is turning off my phone, which sounds really simple, Um, but like turning off my phone, turning off my TV, actually unplugging from the constant shock collar of news that, that comes in and giving myself some time and space to think more deeply and more long form (laughs) than um, then I'm, then I'm able to do if I'm constantly responding to emails and, and on Twitter and, and getting, and getting the news. So unplugging, frankly, uh, I think is, is really important. Just going for a walk or sitting with a legal pad outside someplace seems like, um, what maybe we all need <laughs> right now. <laughs> I don't know, Molly, what about you? I don't know how productive you've been. I have not been terribly productive in this time and I'm trying to like tell myself that's okay. So, uh, yeah, I, um, I try to keep that word out of my writing life. Um, I think one of the benefits of, of maybe not having a traditional path as a poet, you know, I, I wasn't an English major, I didn't do an MFA after undergrad. I do have one now. I got a low residency MFA later in my life, but I was always trying to write around the edges of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, 
and I had three little kids born close together and I have paid work that I have to do. And, and so I, I think I learned immediately as a writer to how to expand my idea of what writing is for one thing. So I consider reading to be at least as much as, at least as valuable, I guess, as writing, if not more. Um, and there are many days where all I write is maybe one word or a list of words, or I copy down a line of a poem that I read that I think is interesting or that somehow calls to me. I, I'm very, I'm very much kind of a workhorse in terms of showing up at my desk every day. Um, but it's not to like commit an act of literature. It's just a practice that <laughs> that phrase is so that, great. <laughs> that it's just a practice that helps me be who I am. And I read and I write a little and sometimes I go for months and years and think, oh my God, I haven't written anything. And then I look back through my drafts folder and I find out that, oh, I actually have written more than I realized. So just kind of, I think, removing the idea of productivity and, and just thinking about all the different ways of writing, reading, writing a list of words, thinking. you know, copying down a poem, thinking. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be this, um, you know, writing a draft every day or writing a certain number of words every day. Yeah, I mean, really anything you do in service of your writing counts. And the word productivity when we think about the word product mm -hmm. as part of that, it does have that kind of icky, icky feeling where I might be able to attach that word to like other kinds of work, but I would love to sort of separate my art from that mindset if I can. That's capitalism. We don't really want to be thinking about that when we make art. I, I will that. say though that I, I have great empathy for the feeling of wanting to write poetry, but not being in a space where poetry is flowing. Um, that I've been in, in spaces like that and it, it's difficult, but I guess my experience has been if I keep showing up, if I keep reading, if I keep writing down that one word or copying down that one line, eventually the poems out themselves. Yeah, the, it comes back. Well, we've reached the top of the hour, um, and so it's time to wrap up. But thank you to Maggie Smith and Molly Spencer for a really, truly special evening. It's so great to have you both virtually at Literati Bookstore in lieu of physically, but we hope to have you both in the store again in Ann Arbor, uh, downtown in our event space very, very soon on the other side of things. Um, but thank you again for being here. We hope you continue to be well and stay safe. And you, to, to all of our... Uh, uh, attendees this evening thank you for being here thank you for supporting our bookstore and um, be safe and well as well and we look forward to seeing you at the next event take care everybody